All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first session of Skype a Scientist Live for 2024. Uh, today, we are joined by shark biologist, uh, co-founder of a nonprofit, uh, scientist extraordinaire, Amani Weber-Schultz. Thank you for joining us, Amani. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. All right, so we have ahead of us about 45 minutes of a Q&A session where we're going to answer all of your questions about sharks. So during this time, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen um, to ask all of your questions. We are going to attempt to get through as many questions as we possibly can over the next 45 minutes. Um, but just so everybody knows, if you want to have a session with your class, with your after school club, with your library, scout troop, whatever, with a scientist, because you have a lot of curious people and a lot of questions in your group, feel free to sign up for a session just for your group at skypeascientist.com. We've got plenty of scientists. We have like 300 people RSVP today. So we're going to try to get through as many questions as we can. But if we don't get to yours, there are other shark scientists too that will be happy to talk to just you, um, just your group. All right. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Amani, who will tell us, uh, you know, who she is, what she does, why she likes it, what that looks like. Uh, thank you again for being with us. Yeah, I'm so excited. So I just have a couple of slides to introduce myself to you all amazing classrooms. Um, and then we'll have optimal time to answer all these amazing questions that I'm seeing in the chat already. Let me share my screen. All right, can I confirm that you can see this? Cool, okay, so my name is Amani. Um, I am a PhD student. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. So this photo all the way on the left is a picture of me when I was around three at the Monterey Bay Aquarium with my aunt, which is, what I consider to be the best aquarium on earth, um, and also probably a very large component of why I'm a marine biologist now. Um, so I went to school, I did all the way up through high school in California, and then I moved all the way across the country to New Jersey, where I did my undergraduate degree in marine biology at Rutgers, which is what this middle photo is. Um, yes, this is a photo of me in my scuba diving gear sitting on top of uh, a little wall that's outside of the Marine Sciences Building. And what you can't see here is on the left kind of cut out of this photo is a wave. And I was like, I have to take a photo in my scuba stuff outside of this building. So I looked, looked absolutely insane taking this picture. Um, I graduated in 2020. Um, and during my undergrad, I did a lot of research experiences. I had a really awesome time. I went to Thailand, which is what these two photos on the right are. Um, to look at cave fish. So fish live in a lot of different places, one of which is caves. Any sort of cave that has water, you can find fish. Um, and the fish that we were looking at is a blind cave fish, so it cannot see, it doesn't have eyes, um, but it spends its time walking up waterfalls, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and I got to spend time there. So if you want to do marine science, you don't necessarily have to be in a place that is only in the ocean. You can go to a lake, you can go to a cave, um, you can be in a landlocked state. It really doesn't matter where there is water. There is almost always fish. Um, so what do I do now? Um, I'm a PhD student. I do still live in New Jersey and I research sharks. So part of my time is spent, I go down to Miami, Florida, where I teach people um, how to do shark research. So I get a lot of prospective students from a lot of different classes around the country and around the world. Um, and we teach them about how to do research with live sharks. So we catch them. We do a lot of different um, tasks on them. We might measure them. Um, we do very similar things to like if you went to the doctor, right? We take a measurement. We see how their body is doing. We might take some blood to look at their blood. Um, and then we throw them back in. So we don't keep the shark. We catch it. We have a whole lot of different protocols to make sure that the shark is safe. And then we throw them back in the water and they go and live their merry little life in the ocean. Um, and I really love doing this. Teaching is a lot of fun. And as you can see, I get to be around a lot of different sharks. So that middle photo at the top is a bonnet head. The bottom photo at the right is a black tip. And then that giant tail at the top right hand side is a sandbar shark. So I get to do a lot of stuff with a lot of different types of sharks. And then when I'm at school, so when I'm not in the field and I'm in the lab, um, I play around with dead sharks. So there are amazing areas around the country and museums where they have collections. So they keep a lot of different dead fish for researchers to use um, to do research that you might not be able to do if you don't have access to sharks or that you can't do on a live shark. Um, so I do things like take x-rays of sharks. So just like when you go to the doctor and you kind of sit on that little bed and you go into an x-ray, I do that with dead sharks. Um, I also look at their scales. So sharks are covered in scales, even though it doesn't look like they are. 
Um, and I kind of look at all of the different shapes and sizes of those scales and how that kind of influences their ability to swim around in their environment. Um, and then the last thing that I do is, like Sarah mentioned, I have a nonprofit called Minorities in Shark Sciences, which I co-founded with some amazing friends of mine. And our mission is basically just to advance the field of shark and ray and marine sciences um, by creating all these opportunities for our members who are gender minorities of color. Um, so anyone who kind of falls into that envelope and we do things like provide community and access to a large network. We also provide research opportunities and mentorship opportunities. Um, and there's opportunities for K through 12 as well. So we provide camps and spring break cramps. Um, and then when you get older to 18 plus, we also provide things like travel camps and travel grants and a whole lot more. Um, and if you want to learn more about Miss, I dropped our Instagram at the bottom of the screen as well as our website. And I'll definitely throw it into the chat as well. Amazing. I just put uh, missalasmo.org in the chat as well. Excellent. Okay. You. So we already have 50 questions. So rapid up. fire. Let's do it. Okay. Um, first question. Do sharks have boogers? Yeah. Sharks do have boogers, actually. Their boogers don't look exactly like ours, um, but they do have a nose just like us and they can get little bits of gunk in there that hopefully leaves as well, even though they don't necessarily blow their nose like we do. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, do sharks ever use tools? Mm. Well, they don't necessarily use tools like we do. So we have like chainsaws and hammers, um, but they do use different tools to kind of move around in their environment. They have a lot of different senses like us. They can see, they can hear, um, they can smell, and they also have this really amazing ability to sense electricity in the water. So they can kind of swim around in their environment um, and sense that electricity that might come off of you if you're moving your fingers or moving a muscle um, and kind of see what's going on, which is pretty fascinating. Amazing. Thank you. All right. Uh, Avery wants to know, do you sit in an office all day or do you actually go out and observe sharks? Oh my goodness. I love this question. Um, I do sit in an office. I sit in an office quite often. I would say probably 80% of my year is sitting in an office and then 20% of my year is on a boat doing shark research, but that is just because of the type of job that I have. So because I'm a, a PhD student, I have a lot of writing, I have classes and things that I have to do that are located in a building in a lab. Um, but if you do kind of any sort of other job, like you could be a technician on a boat, you could work at an aquarium, um, you might spend a lot more time dealing with live animals or being on a boat. Yeah, thanks. Uh, our next question is from Ms. Dunkoff's fourth grade class. Is there any shark that feeds on plants? On plants? Yes, actually. Um, there's a couple. I will tell you my favorite, uh, which is the bonnethead shark, which likes to eat seagrass. And it can actually digest seagrass um, and take nutrients out of the water. But you also have sharks like your megamouth shark and your uh, basking shark, which are uh, the largest sharks in the ocean right after the whale shark. Um, but they also eat plants, which is really fascinating. Awesome. Very cool. We've had a couple people ask, um, how long do sharks live? Oh, man, we have no clue is the real answer to that question. It is very hard to age a shark. A lot of times the shark has to actually be dead for you to try to figure out how old it is. Um, there's a couple of different methods that we use for aging sharks, one of which a lot of people know about the Greenland shark and the estimated age for them is between 250 and 500 years for living. Um, nurse sharks, we know they can live to up to 43 in age. Um, that's the oldest we've seen in nurse sharks. Of course, they could live longer than that. Um, and then there's probably some sharks that have shorter lifespans as well, but it is really hard to figure out the age of sharks. So the answer is we really don't know. Cool. Uh, we've got a question from Maddie. What is a group of sharks called? A shiver. A I shiver? If I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, that might be raised though. I think it's a shiver though. But I don't know. Now I'm questioning it because I don't really deal with groups of sharks often. So I'm sure there's some shark scientist out there or even a kid in one of the classrooms watching who's like, that's wrong. And I might be wrong. It's true. So definitely shiver for rays. Yes, uh, maybe, maybe shiver sharks. for sharks. It cool. might just be called a school for sharks since they are a fish. Right, right. Very cool. Um, all right. We've got another fourth grade class question. What is the biggest shark and how big is it? It's a whale shark. And to my knowledge, research says that they can get up to 60 feet, which is ridiculous. What's a thing that's 60 feet long? School buses, I think, are about 40 to 45 feet long. Yeah. So longer Maybe than like that. Maybe like an airplane? Like, a, like a, a, an airplane? Like a domestic flight airplane? 
Great. Sounds good. Um, Claire wants to know, about how long have sharks existed? Oh, goodness. 450 million years, which is a really long time. It's older than trees, and it's also older than Saturn's rings, which is absolutely crazy. That's one of my favorite facts. So yeah. good. Um, really long time. Not as long as squid, but we're well, not as long as cephalopods, but almost as long as cephalopods and cephalopods. They're almost as cool. <laughs> which are, yeah, almost, almost. Uh, <laughs> Our next question, why do hammerheads have two heads? Oh, goodness. So hammerheads do not have two heads. That crazy hammer shape that they have is, in fact, one head. They have an eye on each side, and they also have a nostril on each side of their head as well. Um, and the short answer is we don't really know why they have that head shape. Um, the slightly more kind of complex answer is we think that they use it um, because of where they live in their environment. So hammerheads eat rays, which are down in the sand um and there are videos of them using that big hammer to pin the rays down to eat them so having kind of like an extra set of hands on the tip of your head might actually be really useful for what they like to eat cool sounds good yeah, um i love them got, they're crazy <laughs> they're so cool when i used to collect squid they would um little baby hammer heads that were just like the little itty bitty baby ones would be in the same water as the little baby squid were um fully grown squid just they happen to be eh, this thing um and i get excited every time i would see what it was a, so good, fun. a good moment all right from saint rose in newtown connecticut and this is also a question that like about seven other people have asked uh how far away can sharks smell blood Oh, this is a very good question. Um, so everyone knows the statement, a shark can smell a drop of blood from a mile away. Um, this is likely not true. And here's why. So when we smell as people, a particle of the thing that we're smelling has to actually enter into our nose to smell. So if let's say a house is on fire a mile away, but the wind is not blowing in a way that makes it so those smoke particles move down and get into your nostril, you'd have no clue that there's a fire a mile away or even next door. Um, shark smell is the exact same. So a particle of what they're smelling has to actually get into their nose at a large enough size for them to detect it. So if they are swimming and the scent is upstream um, and it travels down to their nose, then sure, they could definitely smell it if there's enough of it. But if they are kind of in a different area where the water is not moving, then they might not even know that there's something there. So you could drop a whole bunch of blood in the water. And if there's absolutely no movement of water, the shark will have no clue that there's blood in the water. Cool. Very cool. Uh, Mrs. Mallory's second grade class wants to know, how do you catch a shark? What a good question. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to catch sharks. For research, people use rod and reel. So your typical fishing rod that you throw a hook out and you kind of reel the shark in. Um, you can also use something called a long line, which is just exactly what it sounds like. There's a very long line that has two anchors at the end to make sure it doesn't float or move anywhere. And it has a bunch of hooks lined up in between to try to catch sharks that are swimming in the area. Um, and then the last thing that people will use is called drum lining, which is actually my favorite form of fishing. Um, your drum is just a weight and it sits on the seafloor and it has a hook that goes out um, or a piece of hook at the end. And if a shark grabs it, they kind of get stuck in that spot, but they can swim around in a circle until you haul them in. Um, and on all of those hooks, you have bait. And you can choose different bait or pieces of dead fish, depending on the type of sharks that you are targeting. So if we want to catch really big sharks, we use really big chunks of bait. We might use something like barracuda. Um, but if we're looking for something that's smaller, that has a way tinier mouth, we're not going to give them a giant piece of bait that they can't get down their throat, right? We're going to give them a little tiny piece of bait. Um, so yeah, those are usually the three ways that people use most in shark research to catch sharks. Very cool. Um, our next question has also come in from a bunch of different people. Um, how many types of sharks are there? Oh, what a good question. Um, over 500 is the number that we are at right now. I don't think we have an exact number. I've read a couple of papers that say 523. I've read ones that say 540. It really, we know we're over 500, but after that we're like, it's a number. Cool. Uh, Miss Close class wants to know, what do sharks feel like? What do they feel like? Oh, I also love this question. Um, so sharks have scales, like I said. Um, and if you think about petting, let's say your furry friend at home or your, your friend's pet at home, um, if you pet a shark from head to tail, they're super smooth. Just like if you touch your dog or your cat, it's very, very smooth. And if you try to put your hand backwards, it's rough. So if you try to pet a cat or a dog from tail to head, all their hair kind of flicks up and it's way harder to get your hand up their body. Shark scales are just like that. So they're very rough 
from head uh, from tail to head and very smooth from head to tail, which is really fun. Very cool. Um, what shark do you work with most often? What do you like encounter in field work the most? Hmm. I think it varies. I think it's a tie between a couple of different species. So I see bonnet heads a lot, which are in the hammerhead family. They have a hammerhead very similar. Um, I see black tips a lot. So this is just a species of shark that has black on the very edge of their fins. Um, I see black noses a lot, which are really fun. They have a little black dot on the tip of their nose, like they ran into some wet paint or something. Um, and then I also see nurse sharks a lot, which like to sit on the seafloor and they're very brown. Um, they don't move around a ton. So I think it's probably a tie between those four species. Very cool. Um, we had a couple questions about how sharks drink. Do sharks drink ocean water? Do sharks get thirsty? How does that work? So sharks, I guess you could say that they maybe drink because what they do is they pull water into their mouth all the time and then they push it out over their gills to take all the oxygen out, but they don't actually swallow the water that they're bringing in, right? Their throat is closed. They bring it in, they push it out and they take a bunch of the oxygen out. Um, sharks are constantly battling in their environment. So we have to drink water because we would dry out if we didn't drink water. Um, we also use the water for a lot of different processes in our bodies. Sharks, because they're in salt water, salt likes to suck things out. It likes to dry things out, right? So if you get in a salt bath, you come out all wrinkly. Um, or if you put a little piece of some living organism in salt, wrinkly, wrinkly, it likes to suck out all of the um, liquids and water inside. So sharks are constantly battling with figuring out how to keep their internal wet enough with fresh water um, and also not have it sucked out with the salt. But fish are very much made up of the environment that they live in. So it's very, it's a very interesting process that they have that's different than ours that allows them to kind of maintain that internal um, water amount without drying up well, in their environment. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, a bunch of people have asked, how do sharks hear? Do sharks have ears? Yeah. So sharks do have ears. They're not big like ours. Um, if you look at the, like, if you're looking down at a shark and their head is kind of pointed like this, they have these two little dots, um, usually located kind of a little bit between their eyes and that's their ears. So it's actually really hard to see them unless you're like sticking your head up on a shark. Um, but we think that they use their ears to kind of sense vibrations. So there's a bunch of jelly in there. Um, and when they are swimming around, we think that they're kind of using their hearing ability to sense different vibrations in the water, um, which they also do with the side of their body as well. Cool. Uh, Jason wants to know, do sharks ever fall in love? Oh, I hope so. I hope they fall in love. Um, the hard part about working with non-human things is that you can't just ask them questions. So they might be in love and we just have no way of asking them. And But I hope that they do. I think that would be amazing. That would be so lovely. Um, all right. Mrs. Radoy's second grade class wants to know, uh, why do you play with dead sharks? This is a really good question. So some things that you want to research require the organism to not be alive. So if you think of doctors, for example, doctors will learn on deceased people who have donated their body to science so that we can learn things about the inside of their body. So it's very hard to show someone all the different veins, for example, in my hand, right? You can't cut open my hand while I'm alive to show someone the veins. So I use dead sharks because some of the things that I need to research require the ability to physically open the shark up and look inside of them or even remove parts of their body to look closer at, which we would not want to be doing to any living organism, um, which is why it's really nice that you have things like museums that kind of keep all of these deceased sharks. So whenever you're working with an animal, sometimes you end up with ones that die, um, they'll keep them all. And then their body is not actually being thrown away. It's being used for science. Um, the oldest specimen that I've used, I used a nurse shark from the 1800s, which yeah. is absolutely crazy. And is really awesome that it gets to keep being used for science centuries later. That's super cool. All right, Amy wants to know, do you ever get seasick when you're out on the ocean? Oh, yes, I have indeed been seasick and it is not fun. <laughs> yeah, that's rough. I think when I first became, was, was like studying to be a marine biologist, they were like, you know, something like 42% of humans get seasick and therefore 42% yep. of marine biologists will get seasick. seasick. Uh, yeah. you know, and I mean? always, I always say if you meet a marine biologist who has not been seasick, they just have not met the wave that is going to make them seasick because it is going to happen to everybody. Yeah, I'm lucky to have never met that wave yet because mostly I'm yeah. like in the water, not on the water, I think. 
Yeah. Probably. If I went to like Antarctica and like those like wild waves, I'm sure I'd end up seasick too. Um, all right. Michelle wants to know, do sharks poop? Oh yeah, they do. It's not solid like ours though. So all of the kind of videos that we have of sharks pooping, it looks like it's a very liquidy green color, which is super weird and a little bit disgusting. Yuck. Uh, all right. That answers that question as well. Can you just, we've got a bunch of questions around the Megalodon. Is it real? Yeah. What's its deal? Uh, do you want to take yeah, us absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. So the Megalodon is a very famous shark. It is extinct, which means that it died a long time ago. Um, it was one of the biggest shark, if not the biggest shark in the ocean that we know of right now. Um, they had massive teeth, probably like the size of my hand, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and they were very warm water sharks. They had to live in, in parts of the world where the water was constantly very warm. Um, we also know that a lot of their nurseries were in very shallow areas. So a nursery is where sharks go to basically put out all their little baby sharks. Um, sharks don't take care of their babies like our parents take care of us. Um, so they'll kind of deposit them in these areas where they might be able to thrive and live more and have access to all the nutrition that they need. Um, unfortunately, and probably a little bit fortunately, Megalodon is not real anymore, but we do find a lot of their teeth in the ocean. So a lot of you have probably gone to an aquarium or a um, sciences museum and seen a Megalodon tooth because we do go diving and we find them. And that's how we know they were absolutely huge because their teeth were massive. So big. So, so big. Uh, so Liam big. wants to know, uh, do sharks breathe oxygen like we do? They do. Yeah. So they, um, instead of us where we just like suck in and push air out because the thing that we live in is what we can breathe, um, sharks bring water in and then they use their gills to take oxygen out and then expel the rest of the water out of their system. Very cool. Uh, do sharks ever get cold? Mrs. Parkhurst's fourth grade class wants to know. Um, probably. So a lot of sharks actually live in warm parts of the world. Um, there are some sharks that venture into cooler areas. So like the Greenland shark, for example, lives in the Arctic. Um, but if you look at the majority of the distribution of sharks, a lot of them live in warmer waters. And that's because they can't put on a jacket like we can. They have to live somewhere where their environment is good for them. Some sharks will actually migrate away from cooler waters in the wintertime to be in warmer waters as well. So they're kind of just constantly running around looking for the ideal climate, whereas I can just put on a puff coat and go outside if it's cold. Cool. Sounds good. I'm suddenly more grateful for my coat today. Right. Um, me too. <laughs> Mrs. H's class wants to know, how accurately are sharks portrayed in movies? Oh, gosh. I would say not very accurately. Um, I think that they are often portrayed as wanting to eat you, right? Being, like, crazed, really wanting to eat people. They're going insane for blood, a drop of blood in the water, and the shark's going to come get you. Um, all of my experiences with sharks have actually been them not wanting to be remotely near me um sharks are quite cautious they are aware of the fact that they can also die um just like we can and so they try to do things to make it so that they're not putting themselves in danger just like we put a seatbelt on they might not go close to a boat or a new sound that they hear um or they might run away from a shark that's a lot bigger than them yeah they want to survive too great yeah, they do. Um, and movies like to make it seem like they're just going to eat us and i promise you they're not yeah uh, Caitlin wants to know, among many others, do sharks sleep? This is a really good question. And the answer to that is also we don't really know. Um, so we, the closest we have gotten to figuring out if they sleep is we have determined that they have periods of resting where it seems like they're, um, the activity in their body is less. So when we go to sleep, our, we kind of shut down this kind of basic activity going on, but it's not like I'm awake thinking all of my thoughts, right? Um, so we have only been able to figure that out on sharks that sit on the seafloor. So something like a nurse shark or a Port Jackson shark, where we can bring them into a lab, put them into a tank, attach all of these different electrodes to their heads um, to see what kind of what their brain waves are doing. Um, so we know that they rest, but we don't know if they actually sleep, which is a really interesting question and it's quite hard to answer. Sounds good. Um, are there endangered sharks? Absolutely. There are a lot of endangered sharks, more than half. Um, I think the most recent number is 80% of shark species that we know about are likely endangered. Um, it is quite a lot. And this is, there's a lot of different reasons for it. Um, one of the reasons that I will highlight is that they're very slow growing. 
Um, so sharks take a long time to reach maturity, which is when they are able to um, reproduce and have baby sharks, um, very similar to we do. So we have a long period of time before we can have babies and sharks are very similar. Um, but sharks are also combating all of these different things that are changing in their environment and they have less resources to be able to change that. So warming oceans, um, losing habitat and habitat destruction from things like people building um, new buildings are all things that threaten them. And so sharks are trying to figure out how do we um, change with that to be able to survive longer. Sounds good. Um, what is the smallest shark? The smallest shark is the dwarf lantern shark. It is a deep sea shark and it is likely the size of my hand, which is really tiny. tiny. I saw one in person one time. I felt like I was seeing a celebrity. Couldn't believe it. I was at school. You saw one in person? Yeah. They had one at like the, in like that open marine lab area at Scripps. Freaked out. Wow. I would love to I thought see I'd one never of see one. I was like, That's I just, cool. I didn't think that would be a thing I could encounter in my day. Um, totally couldn't believe it. Um, all right. Can different classifications, this is from Mrs. Bono's class, can different classifications of sharks communicate with each other? And in general, how do sharks talk to each other? Oh, this is a good question. And it's another one that we don't know. We don't actually know if sharks talk to each other. Mm -hmm. um, they certainly don't talk in the way that I am talking to Sarah right now. Mm -hmm. um, we know that they can sense their environment. So one of the ways that they do that is they have something called a lateral line, which runs all the way down the side of their body. And it kind of lets them sense um, vibrations in the water. So if you look at something like a group of sharks that are all swimming together, their lateral line is detecting who their closest neighbor is. So if Sarah and I were standing next to each other, I would have a little line down my body that could tell me how far she is from me or that she's no longer close to me at all. Um, so we know that they can communicate kind of silently in that way, but whether or not they talk to each other, there are different ways of talking. So I'm physically speaking, some animals use chemical cues. So they'll put out different types of chemicals to communicate with those around them. Um, some make noises rather than actually speaking out loud, like whales, they make noises, but whales are really fascinating because they have language, which we don't think sharks have. Um, I wish they could talk. I think it would be really cool to talk to a shark. Awesome, me too. I, I would love to talk to a shark. Uh, our next question is, um, how do sharks see? Can they see in color? What is like a visual world for a shark look like? Yeah, so my understanding about this, and the last time that I read a shark vision paper was like two years ago, uh -huh. um, is that sharks don't see the amount of colors that we do, and some of them can actually be colorblind. So they might only see in one or two colors, or they might only see in kind of white and gray color. Um, you can learn about that sort of thing by actually looking at the lenses in their eyes. So you basically like dissect a shark's eye um, and see what's going on in there. But I do not research that, and so I don't actually know a ton about shark vision and where we're at in the world of learning what they can see. Totally. Next question. Um, are sharks ever cannibalistic? Oh yes. Sharks are indeed cannibalistic. Um, so I think I touched on this a little bit earlier, but sharks have nurseries where they'll put their baby sharks. And part of the, the motivation for putting them there is that if you put a tiny baby shark in shallower water, a larger shark probably can't come into the really shallow water and eat them. Um, but sharks do eat each other and they do continue to eat each other as they get larger. Um, I have seen a shark try to eat another shark and it was very interesting and a lot slower than I thought it was going to be. Sweet. Sounds good. Um, have you ever been bitten by a shark? I have not. I have never even been close to being bitten by a shark. Nice. A professional. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, generally speaking, what shark is considered to be the most dangerous to humans? Um, so I think my understanding is that it's there's three that are the top ones and they kind of rotate around each other. So you have the great white shark, um, you have the tiger shark, and you have the bull shark. And all of these kind of fall into the aggressive category, um, largely because they also like to be in places that we like to be in when we go into their environment in the ocean, and also because they get big enough to be able to kind of eat whatever they want. So those three species don't really have a lot of predators. Um, I think the one we all know about is orcas who've been eating gray whites. Um, yeah. But generally speaking, they get quite large and they don't really have to worry about something else eating them. And so they kind of like to go around and eat other things, um, which is why people end up getting bitten by them quite often. Yep. Happens to the best of us, you know. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite shark? My favorite shark? Oh, 
I'm so happy you asked me. Um, my favorite shark right now is the bonnet head, which I talked about. Um, very small hammerhead. They are omnivorous, so they eat meat, but they also like to eat seagrass. Um, and then my second favorite shark, of course, is the great hammerhead because they look absolutely ridiculous. And I just think they're majestic every time I see them. And it's hard to not get excited when you're in the presence of something that amazing. Totally agreed. Hammerheads are <laughs> top tier, top tier sharks. Yes. Um, why do sh sharks have a fin on their back? This is a great question. So sharks have a fin on their back and we think that it provides balance for them. So they're not kind of tipping in all these different directions while they're swimming. Um, but it also helps them with turning. So we think that having that fin on the top allows them to make really tight turns in some scenarios. Um, and some even have two. And we don't actually know why there's two. We don't fully understand what's happening. We understand that it likely has to do with the movement of water around their body, which means that it probably provides an advantage to them in moving through water. Um, but it's very hard to test what fluid is doing around the body of a shark. It's tough. Uh, yeah. Very complicated, especially the big ones. Um, yeah. Mrs. Cook's second grade class, among many others, would like to know, how can you tell if a shark is a boy or a girl? Good question. So these are all, wow, these are all such great questions. And some of these I haven't been asked in a very long time. We've also had, there are currently 712 unanswered questions. We've oh, only gone through 100. I have to start going faster. Yeah, we, we can only go so fast, um, but this is a curious bunch. Thank you everyone for your questions. Yeah, this is amazing. Um, so you can tell the difference between a male shark and a female shark um, by flipping them over on their stomach. And male sharks have something called claspers, which are, they have two. So they have these paired claspers that sit right underneath their stomach under their pelvic fin. Um, and that sticks out. And that is what they, that is what their sexual organ is to be able to reproduce. Um, and females don't have one. Females have a hole, which is called a cloaca. Um, and the claspers insert into that hole. And that is how you get baby sharks. Nice. Uh, Mindy is asking the old, age old question. Do sharks fart? Honestly, I don't know. Fish fart. I'm not sure. Like bony. No, they probably, fart. they do. So they probably do. I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen like a published study on a shark's fart though. We need more fart studies, I think. Yeah. Uh, maybe whoever asked that will become a fart scientist. Uh, that, yeah. It's, it's critical information that we all need to know. Yeah. Uh, hard hard to know uh rebecca wants to know do sharks get the same illnesses as we do oh this is also a good question we don't think so so we do think that fish fish can get sick we know that fish can get sick which means since sharks are fish they can also get sick um they can get probably versions right so someone a long time ago said that sharks don't get cancer um and cancer is just duplicating of cells uncontrollably um and sharks can have that kind of duplication of cells um, in their body, but whether or not their sickness looks like ours, it probably doesn't. Um, and it's easier to study that in something like an aquarium setting, because you can have fish that get sick, and then it's a lot easier to figure out what's going on inside of them. Um, but with a wild shark, it's really hard to tell if it's sick, because it's not walking around blowing its nose, and it's certainly not coughing. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, Talia wants to know, why is a nurse shark called a nurse shark? Oh, this is great. Um, so this question is, we're not entirely sure. Um, we think that it came from a group of people calling it a hus shark. Um, and it kind of just hus kind of switched into nurse is one kind of idea behind where that came from. Um, we also think it's possible that it was something that sailors started calling them because they kind of sit on the seafloor so often. Um, and so nurse was kind of just the word that they came up with, whether that be from like a nursing baby um, or just nurse is the word that they thought of it's a very odd name for the shark um which i think this is a good point to make that common names so nurse shark hammerhead shark tiger shark we consider those to be common names and they can have a lot of different one shark can have a lot of different common names so a sand tiger shark um which is a type of a shark off of the coast of new jersey is called a ragged tooth shark in another part of the world but it's the exact same shark um so we often will use their latin name or their scientific name instead so for a nurse shark, instead of saying, oh, that's a nurse shark, then you would call it Ginglymostoma serratum, which stands for hinge mouth in Latin. Um, and that name comes from the fact that they suck their prey in really heavily. Cool. Very cool. Are sharks ever friendly? Yeah, certainly. There are some species of sharks that are considered quite curious and friendly. 
Um, examples of this can be something like a blue shark or an oceanic white tip. Um, they're considered to be more kind of curious if you go diving with them. For example, they're more likely to kind of swim up to you and like check you out with their big old eyes. Um, and then you have other sharks that can be really skittish and like don't want to be around you at all. Very cool. Because they want, they're want they scared. Uh, yeah. What shark lives the deepest? The deepest? Oh, this is, I don't really know. There's a lot of deep Are sea deep. sharks, right? Yeah, so like we have the goblin shark, which is a deep she deep sea shark. The dwarf lantern shark is a deep sea shark. The cookie cutter shark goes quite deep. Um, but I don't know if we've ever been able to figure out what the deepest shark is because a lot of the sharks that we pull up that are that deep are just from fishing and so you can't tell how deep the shark was um and every now and then we probably see a shark on an underwater vehicle that's broadcasting um videos for you i don't know the exact like meterage though for how deep the deepest shark has been found i'm gonna have to look that up yeah i don't know either i know there's a bunch of deep sea ones but i don't know like the hierarchy of who's been seen where no um yeah. Um, do sharks ever get fat? You know, I think that they get, there are some sharks that are fatter than others. So like bull sharks can be really chonky. Um, but whether or not they can get fat as in like consuming too much or not losing weight at the amount that they are consuming. Um, I don't think that they do because they are constantly moving in their environment and they eat until they're full and then they digest and then they eat some more and then they digest. So I don't, I don't think so. Cool. Um, Mrs. Kennedy's first grade class wants to know why is shark poop green? I have no idea. <laughs> cool. I That's actually true. don't know why it's green. <laughs> Sometimes we just don't know. Uh, yeah. What is the fastest shark? Oh, it's the short fin mako. And we think that they can go up to 40 miles per hour when they're swimming. Whoa. Very cool. Yeah. Um, more megalodon questions. Uh, if yeah. we haven't seen every inch of the ocean, how do we know that an extinct shark is extinct? Yeah, this is a really good question. So especially for something like megalodon, um, one of the easiest things to compare this to is the primary thing that megalodons ate were whales. So whales used to be really small, and that was so that they could evade megalodon in some part, right? So they, the smaller you are, typically the faster you can go the more evasion techniques you can take. But we have whales now that get very large. We have the blue whale, we have humpback whales, um, and they are not fast whales either. So in the ocean, there's constantly kind of a um, this balancing game going on of when you are growing into the thing that you are, you want to be big enough that you can protect yourself, but small enough that you can evade other predators. Um, and whales are just like that. So whales are now quite large. And so one of the reasons that we know megalodons are not alive is from how big whales get. Um, they also, like I said earlier, because they lived in warmer waters, a lot of the warmer parts of the ocean, we have studied quite a decent amount. Um, we know that they couldn't live in the deep sea because the deep sea is very, very cold um, and they would not be able to live down there. And we also think that we know that their nursery ground was in shallower water. So we would be seeing likely smaller little baby megalodons swimming around. Solid, cool. Uh, we've got a couple questions about the Northeast U.S. Uh, there, one question was, can you find sharks in the Northeast U.S.? Affirmative. One qu other question was, um, we're seeing more and more sharks like off the coast of Massachusetts. What's that about? Um, so I think for a really good answer to this question, one of the organizations you should look at is the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy. Um, for if you want to know a whole lot about this topic, they certainly know more than I do. Um, but my understanding is that we have sharks kind of moving as the ocean is getting hotter to stay in that area where it's warm enough for them, but not too hot and not too cold for them. Um, we are also seeing that a lot of shark populations are bouncing back. So by bouncing back, I mean, we overfished them to the point that a lot of them, uh, those populations shrunk a lot. Um, and so we've kind of added all these different policies that make it so that you can't remove certain species of shark from the ocean, you can't take them out for consumption or eating, um, and you can't fish for them either for fun, so sport fishing and things like that. And so we are seeing that a decent amount of shark populations are getting back to their normal amount, which to us feels like a whole lot more, but for them was just normal for them. Right, cool. Um, we got a question that I think will have an important answer. Um, from Des Moines, Iowa, uh, what do you think needs to happen to reduce and hopefully stop illegal shark finning around the world? And I'll add 
like what is the biggest concern for sharks um is yeah. it thing or is it something maybe else yeah so um the first thing that I'll say is that the biggest threat that we understand to sharks is not actually shark finning, but it's just the consumption of sharks as a whole or the use of sharks as a whole. Um, so things like their liver are can be used in household name products. Um, we can use their liver in makeup and things like that. So we do actually catch sharks and use the entire shark um, for a lot of different reasons around the U.S. and around the world. Um Shark finning itself is the practice of removing the fins from the body of the shark while the vessel or the boat is still at sea and discarding the shark. So you're not using the rest of the shark. You are removing the fins and throwing them back into the ocean. Um, shark finning in the U.S. has been illegal since the early 2000s, even maybe the late 1990s. I can't remember the exact date. Um, and so when we are fishing for sharks in the U.S., um, we bring the body fully onto land um, and then we use the whole shark. Um, the practice of eating shark fins has also been steadily decreasing, um, and the consumption of it has also been steadily decreasing. Um, but there are a lot of countries all around the world. Um, I think some of the top countries include things like Spain. There's a lot of different areas in Europe that fall into the high category of taking in sharks to trade out or to use them. Um, and then there's also island nations that use shark as their primarily primary meat source, um, which they need, right? They need to be able to do that. And a lot of those island nations have been able to take sharks without depleting from their population in the way that something like commercial fishing does. Um, so I would say probably the biggest threat is just the shark meat trade as a whole, not necessarily shark finning. Um, and in terms of things that you can do about it, one of them is learning a lot. So one of the big problems in conservation is that media outlets pick and choose what they like to report. And so making sure that you are getting the whole picture um, and not aiming your sights on one group of people for one specific reason um, or one specific nation for one um, issue that you think is going on and learning about what the entire problem is as a whole is really important. Um, and the last thing that I'll say is that it's very complex. So figuring out how to conserve sharks and how to make it so that people who need to eat sharks can still eat sharks depending on where they're located um, is a very kind of big debate and thing that's going on in policymaking. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is from Kate. Are there any bioluminescent sharks? Yes, um, I'll give you my favorite example. So the cookie cutter shark is bioluminescent. Um, that is the shark that takes those nice circular hole punches out of animals. If you've seen pictures of like dolphins with a perfect, perfect little cookie cut out of it, that is your cookie cutter shark. Um, they are bioluminescent and they actually use theirs to evade um, predators, but also to attract things that might want to eat them so that they can eat because they live the time, except for when they come up to eat. So they will bioluminesce in a way that draws predators toward them and then just whip around and eat out of them and then zip away, which is pretty cool. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Um, okay, so we have been hitting you rapid fire with questions. Uh, I've marked 147 questions as answered. Uh, some of those are duplicates, but still, that's a lot of questions. We still have 813 unanswered, but our time ends in two minutes. Um, and yeah. so again, um, everybody at, at, at home at school, um, I'm gonna really quick after we're finished, um, go through how to use, how to get a match for just your classroom, just in case. Um, but we have asked to everybody the same two questions to wrap up um, every session. Um, and we'd like to ask you those two questions now. The first question is if you had everyone's attention in the whole world and you could tell them one thing about your area of expertise, what would that be? I think it would be that sharks have been very misunderstood. And part of that has been from the media portraying them like they want to eat us. Um, and I think I would want to say that we should take a step back and really consider if they're like that, which they aren't, um, and how we can better protect them and also better learn to live with them since we share this planet together as a whole. That is great. Thank you so much. The next question is you still have everybody's attention in the whole world. You could tell them one thing about anything. It could be serious and significant or just silly goose fun times. Uh, you still have everybody's attention. What do you tell them? About sharks specifically? About anything you want. About, about anything? About your favorite food. About. Um, I think that I would tell everyone that hot dogs are the best food on the planet and everyone should be eating hot dogs for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> I think that sounds great. I think that sounds great. Um, they make great vegetarian hot dogs these days. Um, they that do. Great. Yeah, they do. Um, the Phillies just got rid of uh, 
dollar dog nights and it's been a big uh controversy here in that's a problem it's a problem um all right that sounds great thank you is there anything else um that you would like to share with us that you'd like to plug any other information uh all good i don't think so i think that was great i loved all of those questions and i've learned a lot of questions that i need to go look up now because i didn't know the answer amazing thank you so much uh for joining us this was amazing um and hopefully we'll hang soon this was wonderful yeah Absolutely. Um, uh, thanks. Um, everybody, let's go through real quick. Um, just in case, if it were, the session is now like the Q&A part has ended. So if you got to go, we'll see you soon. Um, the next session is going to be March 19th. We're going to be talking with a scientist named Theo who studies how sea stars move uh, with their uh, zillions of feet without a brain. How do they coordinate all those feet without a brain? What a wild question. We're going to be talking about it. Um, and I'm just going to share real, real quick how to get uh, a match through our program. So I'm going to share screen uh, right now. Okay. So here's our website. You can um, click sign up. You then go, you are a teacher. Uh, you have to be 18 or over to use um, our program to, to sign up. You click teacher sign up. You fill out this form. If you have a couple sections of the same class, let's say you teach eighth grade biology five times or uh, whatever, um, fill out a form for every time you want to have a conversation. Um, the other thing I want you to know, particularly if you're interested in sharks or any particular thing, um, we have a scientist search tool where you can um, look for specific things. So if you want to study squid, here's everybody that studies squid. If you wanna talk about sharks, here's everybody that studies sharks. If you wanna talk about, I don't know, spiders, we're really sticking with um, S animals right now. Here's all of our spider people. Um, and you can take these names and then put them into the form. Um, there's a part where it's like, what, um, is there a specific scientist that you wanna work with? You can request them there. So generally that's how that works, skypeascientist.com. You just had so many questions and I feel bad that we didn't get to all of them. Um, so if you have a particularly curious bunch, have a session just for you. We've got, you know, it's free. Uh, we're here for you. So uh, please make use of it. Um, and I'll leave you all at that. We will see you on March 19th. Uh, Jasmine, thank you for being here. Very grateful for your work. All right. Bye everyone.